Thank you, Dean Pullen. Um, all right, let's start with the first session. Um, the first session today will be moderated by Bruce Stover. Uh, Bruce's bio, as well as the bios for all of the uh, guest speakers or panel members today, is in your program. Uh, I'm not <coughs> going to take the time to read all those, and I don't think the moderators uh, will either. I think you'd rather hear them than listen to us uh, read the bio. So please refer to those uh, for more information uh, about each of our um, experts today. Um, I will say, though, that Bruce has more than 38 years uh, experience in the oil and gas industry, including an extensive background in international business development while he served as uh, Senior Vice President of Worldwide Business Development for Anadarko Petroleum Corporation. Bruce preceded me as the Chairman of the Advisory Board, and I can tell you that he also spends just countless hours uh, working to improve uh, the Energy Institute. Um, with events like today's symposium. Joining Bruce on the first panel will be Mark Mills, um, Senior Fellow at the Manhattan Institute and CEO of the Digital Power Group. Mr. Mike Ming, uh, General Manager of the GE Global Research Oil and Gas Technology Center right here in Oklahoma City. Um, Dr. James Smith, uh, an energy economist and a professor at SMU in Dallas who specializes in energy studies. And Dr. Joe Stanislaw, uh, founder of the J.A. Stanislaw uh, Group and a co-founder and former president of Cambridge Energy Research Associates. I'll let Bruce say a little more about our uh, panel members today if he wants to. Uh, but again, let me remind you, there's a lot more information in your uh, program today. So, Bruce, I'll turn it over to you. Am I on? Good. Uh, we really do have a a killer panel today, and I'm just real pleased to, to have these guys here with me. Uh, I've got the M&M boys over here and the Double S boys over here. I did this on <laughs> purpose. Mark Mills, uh, and, and I'll I just say something about all of them. We, uh, Mark and, and, and Mike are, are kind of the more technical gurus. These guys are more uh, trained as economists, but they've done a lot of things in their professional lives that go well beyond that. Uh, these, these people have written prolifically. Uh, Joe co-authored the book Commanding Heights. Uh, uh, bestseller uh, a few years ago, 2005, was The Bottomless Well, which you co-authored, Mark. And um, I know, Jim, you've, you've written lots of papers on your subjects. And uh, Mike Ming is, is our local guy. He is, uh, was former Secretary of Energy for the state of Oklahoma and now heads up the GE oil and gas research uh, and technology here, and they chose Oklahoma City as the site for this over a number of other places, and we're really pleased to have him here. And uh, so these guys will add a, a, a real uh, real value to the discussion today. Uh, our subject is kind of global in nature. We're talking about the forces that shape energy. We're going to be talking about the, 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 the forces that will shape supp supply and demand in the years ahead. Uh, competitive forces, uh, policy forces, uh, geo geopolitical forces, and those kind of things. And, and one thing I think we can assure ourselves that the future, as Yogi Berra says, uh, the, the future ain't what we thought it was. Or, <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's just going to be different. And we are going to pontificate and ask these guys to pontificate and tell us their view of it. Uh, but the thing I think you'll see is, my view is this, that the future for energy is going to be exciting, uh, particularly in this country as we lead the world in uh, energy technology development and uh, providing uh, really a long-term long resource of abundant, low-cost energy that fuels economic growth uh, in this country and throughout the world. So uh, I'm going to start the conversation. This is a kind of fireside chat. Um, Let's start with demand uh, for energy, and let's start with uh, uh, that would be for power, for transportation, industrial, commercial use, residential heating and air conditioning. That's sort of the whole gamut of demand. And as we look for demand in oil, uh, many experts think that uh, can, demand for oil will rise from 96.5 million barrels a day globally to uh, at least 100 million barrels a day by 2020, so that's only three years. Uh, that's a pretty pretty good growth considering what we've seen in the last few years. What factors uh, impact this expectation, both upward and downward? And do you agree with that trend? Um, what factors are going to uh, affect that 
forecast upward and downward as we go forward over the next few years. And I'll just start with uh, Jim Smith. Uh, you, you got a view on that? Is, is my mic on? You there can you hear go. me? Well, I guess we should say that would be a softball question for an economist, although it's not, but it's a short-term forecast. Three years, if we can't look out three years, we, we don't come back to the rest of this conversation and talk about 10, 15, 20 years down the road. But I don't think it's easy to, to forecast the next three years because there's so much uncertainty about the growth rate of the world economy now. We've got different segments of the economy, including Asian, including Europe, including the Americas, uh, which have gone through a very traumatic uh, pullback in terms of growth. We've got changed uh, regimes. We've got maybe a new look at the global trade picture and how that could affect growth. So yes, it's plausible that the demand could get to 100 million barrels a day. Uh, it's, it's not that far out of reach, although we could see a lot of headwinds against that. And, and right now, I don't think anyone has the answer for that. What do you think the headwinds are? Uh, anybody want to comment on the headwinds? Do you see them? I want to make a different comment to begin with. Okay. Uh, I want to say to all of you in the audience that Bruce is as, as much an expert in all this as we are on the panel. He's underplaying himself. I want to use a quote from the Quran. It's the first line of the Quran. He who foretells the future lies even he tells the truth. Think about that. And I think what Jim is just saying is part of that comment. Uh, you know, it doesn't look that far off, to, uh, 2020. In fact, I, I did one of the first international studies back in the, in the 70s, uh, looking to the year uh, 1985 and then 2020. Uh, you know, that was like really way out heck out there. Uh, three years is tough. Uh, and yes, we know this year it's going to grow maybe one million barrels a day, we think, right now. But there are headwinds. What if something happens in Washington, D.C., we put up these border taxes? Uh, we put up the trade barriers. You know, this, we're going to, we could be going back to the 1930s again. Uh, and that could be a repeat of you know, 2008, 2009. I don't, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but there are headwinds and they're serious. If you say, you know, what's your best bet? Put your life on the line. I wouldn't do it, okay? <laughs> uh, I might bet some money, but you know, I'd say, yeah, it's very reasonable. We'll, we'll be at uh, 100 million barrels a day uh, by 2020. It's reasonable, it's plausible, but there are headwinds. Uh, look at the Middle East. There could be a major disruption there. We are in unknown and unchartered territory in the Middle East right now. Uh, that could be a tremendous, not a headwind, it could be a tremendous roadblock uh, for us going forward. These, you know, these are dire comments. Do I think they're going to happen? They're possible. Do I want them to happen? Absolutely not. Uh, but they could. So what do you think the greatest sets? Expand a little bit on your thoughts on the Middle East. I, I really think it is uncharted territory. I spend you know, a good portion of my life going to the Middle East. I'm going back down to Saudi in a couple of weeks. Uh, in the Middle East a couple times this summer, regrettably in the summertime, by the way, because uh, it's so hot and humid. Uh, but you know, the dynamics are up for grabs. Uh, we have Yemen going on. That's a proxy war uh, for Iran and Saudi Arabia. We have the United States right now not very happy about Iran, for obvious reasons. Saudi not happy about that. We are backing different people right now in the, uh, the, the war in Syria. We are sitting right now in this, in this uh, pardon me, in Ankara, uh, Secretary Tillerson meeting with the President of Turkey to say, by the way, we're going to support for the first time, seriously, the Kurds directly uh, to help fight that war because they're the best fighters in the region. I was on board of a company that was in Kurdistan. The Kurds are good fighters. That's the last thing Turkey wants. Turkey's been siding with Russia in, in the battle in Syria. Unlikely bedfellows. Russia has been in bed with Iran uh, in, in the Middle East. Uh, you, you, you go through, it's, it's a web of mixture that we don't know what's going to happen. We don't completely know the power structure and how it's working now in major countries like Saudi Arabia. Uh, we do think we know how it's working, but it's, it's all changing before us. Um, so standing about certainty there is very, very hard. People say we should have a new theory, a new grand strategy about the Middle East. How do you create a grand strategy uh, with all these different actors who are changing alle allegiances daily uh, on us? Uh, so. And, you know, regarding Saudi Arabia, you mentioned in the Middle East generally, they have their own strategy going on, and that is part of the headwind, and that is the Saudis would like nothing more than to reduce their own demand for oil by a million barrels a day, two million barrels a day. 
Uh, they've been subsidizing the prices, not just in Saudi, but in many of the countries, which is artificially stimulated demand. I think they realize that that's unwise going forward for the domestic economic reasons. Uh, and so we, we've got, we could say headwinds and things that people are trying to avoid happening, but some people are actually trying to to deliberately reduce the demand in the, in the very Middle East, which is the producer of mm -hmm. what could be a surplus. Jim's hitting an important nail in the head. Saudi Arabia, four to three times in the past five years, has tried to launch major campaigns for solar power in Saudi Arabia. Why? If they aren't careful, they're going to be an importer of oil. I made that statement here four years ago. Uh, who, who may well, you know, who, who could think about Saudi Arabia importing oil? Well, probably not, but they may, may become a not a net exporter again, in, in, again in the future. It could it could happen, the way they're using uh, oil. Go figure. Let, let me let me uh, take a slightly different tack and step. I mean, I, I'm not an economist, as as my, but I play one on TV. So, uh, <laughs> as we all uh, we all try to uh, deal in economics. Look, I like we, since we're talking about quotes about the future. My favorite is Peter Peter Drucker's when he said he he only forecasts what's already happened, and. Uh, uh, it was a it was a deliberate not it was it was not a line he was joking about he meant he looked at patterns that had inertia that had predictive value they don't they don't guarantee any outcome there's obviously there's a lot of headwinds I would take a slightly counter view in this sense in the, in the class of what's already happened we've had 50 years of modern history we'll just do post World War II history where we we've seen a lot of patterns the world's been a lot of tumult for 50 years we've had a, Seen wars in the Middle East, depending on how you count wars. Uh, we've been involved in every one, the United States, one way or another. Uh, so that, I think that doesn't change. It goes, it goes, keeps, it doesn't stop, right? I, I agree fully. We have, uh, but we have one underlying factor, which is why I would, if I were picking a forecast, I would be more bullish in believing the 100 million barrel per day than a number being lower than today, for a very simple reason that the, the primary appetite of the world has been for centuries, and certainly in modern history to want more of the things that energy provides. And there's pent up demand globally, despite the turmoil. I was in Vietnam last week, and if you look at the exploding economic growth in Vietnam, and I'm the streets of Saigon, and it's a sea of motor scooters. Right? Well, you know, it's no, it doesn't require a genius to forecast those all become cars in under a decade. Most, a lot of them become cars in three to five years. Demand implications of those kinds of things globally are, non, are non-trivial. I don't. I think uh, absent exogenous events like major wars, I don't think minor wars change the, the trajectory. Turmoil in the Middle East at the level we've seen for 50 years actually changes. I agree that Saudi Arabia has an uh, interesting existential problem with the internal demand, but they have an easy solution to stop to stop consuming as much oil internally, which they've chosen not to do. They burn oil and make electricity, which is nutty. I mean, it's just burn gas. They've got neighbors, they've got their own nat natural gas, they've got neighbors with lots of it. Uh, we could sell them a lot of natural gas from uh, Oklahoma and the Marcellus, be happy to ship it over there for them if they're, they're shy. Uh, but that's the easiest quick fix from an, uh, an account balance. But I, I would say big picture trends, the world's got, this recession has created pent up demand. Uh, so I, I would add a couple things. First, kind of to your point on forecasting, uh, we always had a saying, if you live with a crystal ball, you better learn to like to eat ground glass. And and the second, just kind of in the balance of, of the engineers and the economists, I think it was Will Rogers said, I, I guess an economist's guess is as good as anybody else's. Um, <laughs> but I think kind of a little expanding on Mark's point, the headwinds and the tailwinds for oil demand, um, I think you can... And one way to look at it is break the world down between the developed world and the developing world. And if you look even at the international oil companies' forecasts, energy consumption in the developing world is going up, and energy consumption in the developed world is probably on a permanent decline just because our energy efficiency has increased so much. And, and so I think uh, around oil, as Mark said, in, in Asia, they're going to move to cars, and it's and it's going to use oil. Um, so what you know what's going to happen in in the developed world? Um, 
Bloomberg put out some pretty provocative studies that said, you know, it looked at a scenario of, of adoption of electric vehicles and, and whether it displaces 100,000 barrels a day or 2 million barrels a day. Um, you know, I drive a natural gas pickup, but my next vehicle, I'm seriously looking at being an electric vehicle. Um, there's, there's just reasons that it seems logical to do that. Um, for those, especially in the oil and gas industry, that have dismissed that possibility, I would say never say never, and, and if you pushed, you know, uh, even a moderate adoption rate of that, you know, that's, that's one of those things that changes the dynamic. Um, but I think, uh, you know, this, this energy performance of the developed world, if you look at the trajectories, the developing world will follow those same trajectories over time. It'll just take longer. Let me, let me jump in. I'm being very unkind to you, Bruce. I apologize. Uh, uh, I, I don't disagree. Uh, also, first of all, I'm not really an economist, just so you know. Uh, I mean, Jim's being very. I used to be an academic. No academic will claim me now at all. I can promise you. Jim's been. Jim's been you, he's I'll been very nice to me. He's been saying we'll take you back, but most most won't. I, I think if you were in the industry the past couple of years, and I'm in and out of the industry, you said there was no demand. There's a lot of supply. And I think that's the real key. You can't separate demand and supply. I mean, I really share the view that probably it's going to be 20, 100 million barrels a day, probably, most likely. Uh, but I think it's important to remember the headwinds because there's so much supply. <laughs> if even there's a minor headwind, you're challenged. Uh, I mean, even a minor headwind. Minor headwind could be the price of oil goes to $62 right now. Guess what happens? A lot more oil comes out. Guess from where? Look out the back backyard, right here. That, that's a big headwind in the sense of too much supply. So, because often when people think about demand, oh, the price might go up. That, that's, that's the immediate leap. And that's what I'm trying to protect you from. The price could go up, but for, for, you like to put the two in balance. Uh, and keep them there because you can't focus on one side. We know all the factors that will make this, the demand want to go up. There's no question. Population is growing, et cetera. But, you know, be careful because one takes partial information on one side of an equation to draw a conclusion. I apologize. Sure. No, that's fine. But I was going to jump in really with the same kind of point, but maybe with a different perspective. Many years ago, back in the 70s, when I was a young academic, I had a colleague that was sitting, he was an economist, but he was sitting with a group of engineers at the University of Illinois discussing sort of the efficiency of the economic use of energy. And the engineers had lots of great ideas, uh, and we've capitalized on a lot of the thinking from that age. But my colleague, his job for these lunch meetings was to sit there and listen to all of this. And then about halfway through, he would raise his hand and say, what about the demand curve? And what he was saying was, it de you know, the growth of demand depends upon the price level. And could we get to 100 million barrels a day? No question. If the price of oil went back to $30, we'd be there within two years. If it goes to $75, it's not so clear. So while we tried to divide the session into the demand factors and the supply factors, where that gets resolved requires an understanding of both sides. Point. All here, Bruce, but it's, it's all right. <laughs> Demand and price are linked, but then as a, as a technologist, I would then interject the, the price is, is fundamentally technologically determined. Obviously, governments can, can create high prices through punitive regulations or banning you from using land or certain behaviors. But overall, it's a tech. We all, we all know in this but, room, right? But in, in the oil market, it's technology, but it's also Saudi strategy. There's of course, but now, but now that's but that the technological feature of the Saudi strategy is stronger now, obviously, than it was yeah. 10 yeah. years ago. Let me let me just add a demand. Uh, so I I do a lot of long-term forecasting because you, you know we all talked about it. it's a little easier actually to look out 10 years. Absolutely, and three. It's much easier. To, also, people forget. So it's I not, do do. But my problem is they don't forget what I wrote because I wrote it I wrote it too too publicly. Who are but you? Let, <laughs> let, let me let me counter the view that the. Uh, I'm a contrarian on the view that the developed world is, is going to see demand decline. I'll give just two examples of what the what the, what 
what technologists or engineers do that are in sort of the popular space everybody likes. First, electric cars, give or take, doesn't matter very much. I mean, it's going to be fracked gas or fracked oil because you're not going to make that much electricity to charge them with, uh, with wind and solar. It's just not going to happen technologically. So, it's, you know, if you're, if you're a producer, it just means you move to gas instead of oil to propel, propel the cars. And if it's in Asia, you're going to use coal. I mean, it, on the margin, it's 60%, 70% coal. But let's just do two things that are popular in the news. Um, drones, which people like and are very exciting, and there's a lot of uh, hyperbole, but it's actually well-placed eventually. I uh, even, on what? Drones. Mater material science are, are making it a lot easier to make cheap, small aircraft, basically. A lot of discussion about the last or first mile, so-called, of supply logistics going to drones, yeah. uh, which actually is already happening in certain emerging markets for very specific things. But if that, if that trajectory continues, just to put a, a number out there, 10% of, of transportation goes to drones, there's a problem in the universe we live in. You know, it's gravity exists, laws of physics attend. You can't change the fact that the energy cost for BTU mile goes up minimum tenfold if you fly it instead of drive it. Yeah. So if you, if you just take as a benchmark, if the developed world, which has wealth and wants efficiency and speed, moves 10% of freight to drones, that doubles transportation oil use or gas use, depending on how you power the drone. Doubles it. Doesn't decrease it. 3D printers. You know, I talked about 3D printers. They're, they're a big deal. The problem with 3D printers, the good thing about them is they're extraordinarily economically efficient. Great tools. Net-net, they use more energy than casting and injection molding. If it's depending on the part you're doing, anywhere from twofold to tenfold more. Lasers are spectacular physics machines. They, to achieve what they do, you consume energy. In fact, if you, if you do in the order of magnitude calculation and you took what we manufacture today by the means we manufacture today and you 3D printed it with the most optimal mechanisms for 3D printing, you double U.S. manufacturing energy consumption. It doesn't go down, it goes up. These, and those are, those are, these are uh, technological trends that are not linear. They're, they occur at discontinuous steps. Things suddenly become doable. The ca cars suddenly became affordable for lots of people. By suddenly, I mean in historic terms. It didn't happen in a year or two, but over a decade, we went from you know, a few million cars to hundreds of millions of cars. That drove the oil age. Well, your point is the key one, technology. I mean, the energy, by the way, the, you guys sitting here in the oil and gas industry, you're the leading technologists of the world. Uh, the technology you provide in this sector is unbelievable. Uh, a lot of it being adopted in medicine right now, uh, which, which I thank you for, for personal reasons. Uh, but technology is the answer. Uh, we just need to give technology time. Uh, and technology means to make the world better off, we all have to consume more of the things that energy makes more efficient, uh, basically, for a better world. Uh, for me, energy is not oil and gas, by the way. For me, energy is light, it's heat, it's mobility, it's health care, it's clean water. You just go down the list. That's what energy is. And by the way, how many of you are wearing perfume today? Not many men. How many women? How many, who's wearing cologne today? That's oil. Uh, so, you know, we all use it every single second. We don't realize how much of it we use all the time. And technology is making it very simple to use for us. We're missing the technology curve, and I hate to say it, we may be missing the lead on technology right now in the United States. I don't think we should be, but you know, technology is the driving force uh, in every single sector of energy. I'm including oil and gas here too, in the fracking side. Fracking, we're only at, at 2.0 or 3.0 right now. Uh, and wind and solar, we're at 1.0. Insulation, we're at 1.0. All that's like Microsoft Word. We're at, what, 10 or 11 right now? Look what it's done for the economy. That's what energy is going to do in all these sectors, going from 1.0 to 7.0 to whatever the heck the number is. And that's the driver. We, we in this up here right now, we're, still, we're suffering from our old age. We grew up with a mentality of scarcity. And we're talking to you like it's scarce. There's no longer scarcity. It's abundance. It's hard to change that mindset. There's abundance. So energy going up used to be considered, wow, it's a bad thing. It's going up so much. Well, not if technology really works, it's not a bad thing at all. And technology is going to work. And we have a lot of stuff coming out of the ground. And we're going to make that cleaner as it comes out of the ground. You, the industry, have done more to challenge environmental regulations than any other industry. But every time you challenge it, you beat it. You, you create technologies to make it cheaper to produce in many of those environmental regulations. It's remar remarkable. I'm not sure why you aren't have a major PR campaign about that. You've done it for my career 40 years. 
You made every environmental regulation. At first, it's expensive, but you made it less expensive. And look at the price of oil in our gasoline pump right now. And it's cleaner. Let's, let's go back to just demographics. And you mentioned this in the, in the developing world. In 1980, before the first bust that, uh, downturn that I experienced in my career, the population of the world was 4.4 billion people. Now it's 7.5 billion people. And it's projected to be... But the UN estimates it'd be well over eight, 8 billion by 2030, uh, and probably, probably that's certainly trend-wise, that's right. And and most of that growth is in the developing world. That's the thing that is hard to predict: is how their economies, which are, are, I mean, they're all seeking a better life. They're seeking, you know, health and security and all those things, um, elect electricity for their for their homes and towns and villages. Uh, Warm, you know, clean water, all those kind of things, and they're derived from an energy, uh, uh, really a consumption of energy that we can't. It's hard to predict, and I think that's in, in the in the developing world or developed world. I think we're, we're we probably got a better view of it, but I think that's one of the wild cards on the on the upside for demand. That, and you mentioned Vietnam as just an example, but there's hundreds of companies countries around the world probably uh, uh, on that. Let's let's talk about uh, while we're on oil, let's talk about the uh, supply side. One of the things that I've seen happen, observed happening during this downturn, is that there's been a dramatic def uh, deferral by the industry of exploration, uh, particularly offshore. And the exploration is the pipeline that feeds new production. And it is, it is big, chunky production. It's not little dribbles. It is big, chunky bits of production. And, and in many cases, I think uh, there are companies in this room that could probably attest to this, but my observation is that, you know, there's been three years of no, non-exploration. I mean, three years. And then uh, limited development work on the discoveries that had been made offshore. And that's, that's the United States, you know, offshore Gulf of Mexico, North Sea, Brazil, uh, West Africa. That's the pipeline that feeds it. And the underlying, underlying uh, production base that we're all typically forecast in the past, has always had a pretty much, unless it was in the 80s, a continuum of that exploration uh, machine that feeds the pipeline. That is a, you know, underlying decline of that is significant, uh, the implications for the underlying decline. And some experts believe that, that the shale, the U.S. onshore shale, cannot fill that gap. And that in a couple of years, uh, with this kind of modest uh, demand growth, that, that you know, we might be in for another price spike because of that, the, the industry being able to catch up with the expiration. What do you think? What do you all think about that? Any any thoughts on that? I, I would start. So Schlumberger came out this week and said we're dramatically underinvesting. Okay, and that we're going to pay the price for that. The challenge, and and just take Devin as an example. Devin made a corporate decision here a few years back to uh, dispose of their international assets and their deep water assets because they did a risk adjusted rate of return calculation. Um, shales redefine things. So, you know, capital is a coward. Uh, that was an Oklahoma congressman quote, J.C. Watts, I believe, said that. But, you know, if you look at shale and you say, I can invest hundreds of millions of dollars in two and three year time blocks, I can really uh, manage my risk. But if I'm going offshore and I'm going to invest billions of dollars for maybe a 15-year time frame from first expiration to first production with no on and off ramps, okay, the risk pro profile goes up. Now, that said, and that's not an anti-deep water statement because those are big reservoirs, uh, but clearly companies have to make those calculations. And right now with the cost curve of U.S. independence, it challenges it. So, how does offshore have to come back into play? They've got to drive down costs just like the shell players did, and, and how might that happen? Clearly, there's going to be standardization of, of uh, you know, majors have had very customized technology programs that simply don't economically compete. Um, but we are going to need those resources, but that side of the equation is going to have to follow the model because the bar's clearly been set by shale on, on the cost side. But it, as the consequence of this, though, interesting for all the world's oil producers or consumers, 
And I, think, and I wrote a paper, as you know, a couple of years ago called Shell 2.0, where, where I proposed that we are entering a new regime of faster, more, essentially more volatile oil prices on shorter cycles and more range bound. That is not to say that you can't have episodic high spikes, but precisely because of the velocity of shale. Oil goes up to 60 and stays there for a bit. And I think a lot of forecasters are saying that just precisely because of the decline in uh, exploration and major project development and the natural decline curves of the big field. So you're going to face that little crossover again. Uh, you know, it's called a commodity cycle for a reason. The word cycle has meaning. But I think what we'll see is precisely because you can add so much capacity so fast in the United States that we'll, we'll do it again. In a sense, do it again means we'll flood the market again. You stay, pri stay prices, stay have prices stay up for a year or two, I think you get a land rush again. And you know, uh, Harold Hamm said this uh, last year in an interview, right, at Forbes. He said, we can do it again. He was referring to people in Oklahoma and, and the rest of the shale fields that we can double production again. I mean, we can add another five or six million barrels per day to American production. I don't think there's any doubt that's possible. Uh, if that happened quickly, I mean, if that, if in the same kind of time frames, if in five years we added a million barrels per day of supply, price will collapse again. Sure. But we haven't had this kind of uh, velocity at that volume in the history of the oil industry. It's only happened once before when the Gawar field came online, and it didn't rise as fast as U.S. shale did. U.S. shale rose more in one year shorter. So this, this has redefined the volatility structure, stays volatile. We're sort of the throttle and break with the Saudis, which is kind of an interesting dynamic. And if you divide the world into three sort of producers, the oligarchs and monopolists, right? They produce about 30 million barrels per day, roughly. Deep water, right? And then shale. I mean, those, those are the sort of, if you think about the three kind of classes, the oligarchs got nothing else to sell. So they're going to keep investing, right? But that doesn't change the fact that commodity prices are set on the margin. I just think that we haven't, we haven't figured out how fast the cycles are going to be. We're, we're, we're in the middle of the first experiment. But I, th I think we're going to see some, it's, going to be, it's going to be like the rodeo. It's going to be, it's going to be very different than in the past. That, that's, what, that's what they're all missing. You're absolutely right. You here in this room and your colleagues in this part of the world, you make decisions differently from a large number of the producers. Uh, my view is Saudi made a mistake. If they're trying to weed out more production, they should have held on longer. Sure. But quickly, you know, what you've done here is reduce cost dramatically. I'm involved with a small company uh, on the water side, which we have a fund I'm involved in. They reduce the price of water by 70%. They do continuous recycling for you. You have to truck it in and out. That's remarkable. And it's, and it's, it's scalable in units. Boom, 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 uh, like that. You know, and they are re reducing their own cost structure not right now for themselves by 70%. The, the, the ingenuity and creativity in this sector is amazing. It's different from that, that sector over there, the oligarch sector, you call it. Uh, it's very different. And they can't get their hands quite around that, basically. So you're going to cause them a lot of problems, uh, basically. But it still comes to a point, do we really need to worry about the heavy, the big offshore stuff? How important will that be? It's a, it's, it's a question mark. We know where most of it's lying right now. We know what could be developed quickly. Quickly means five years, OK? Uh, maybe five years. Uh, finding more stuff takes seven years or eight years. But we know what's on the horizon if we need to go back in. But still five years before you get anything from it. This stuff here moves pretty quickly. Uh, so I think it's, it's a challenge to all market actors right now. But BP has said. Uh, and we know we're friends of people at BP, uh, you know, we're working to be uh, economic in those fields at 50 and under. And everything that's happening on your side, I'm thinking too like the Shell guys, uh, uh, is helping them out, basically. And the other thing is to transform the industry is, you know, all the guys here in the United States who were offshore, no longer offshore. That's, to me, that's more important uh, than the fact you know, we haven't been doing the exploration because we're, we're, the, we're, the, we're the innovation. Uh, and if we're all hunkering down here for good economic, and as you say, capital is a coward, we know we can invest here and make money. Rather than going offshore, we're going to do it here. That takes away innovation from other places. To, to Mark's point on velocity, 
um, you know, a couple of paradigm shifts for those of us gray hairs or no hairs in the crowd. You know, we lived under this scarcity mentality for our whole lives, and now it's all changed, okay? And this velocity thing, in 1981, there were 4,500 rigs running in the United States, and production was screaming decline. 2014, there was 1,900 rigs running in the United States, and we're flooding the market with production. The rig count falls to 400, and, and, and then it starts this slow climb back up, and at about 500, the decline stopped, and now production looks like it's starting to grow again. Yeah. So, you know, this other paradigm shift is the rig count really is no longer the accurate metric. There's a productivity, but nevertheless, um, to, to, to shift this fast, and, and as you said, we've grown production faster in a shorter, or more quantity in a shorter period of time than any time in, in history since we first discovered oil. Yeah. And so it's a completely different world now, and shale's redefined it. One, one thing I think hasn't changed about the cycle. I agree with what's been said about the cycle. Certainly there will be price spikes in the future. We just don't know when, and we can't put our finger on what's going to trigger the next one. But magnifying the cycle, I think, has been governments, host governments, very uh, unfortunate and ill-advised uh, systems of petroleum taxation. You know, what happens there is that when the price goes up, the coffers are full, the governments hike the tax rates up, they put on all types of, uh, you know, sur surplus taxes, special taxes. But it takes a while to do that, so about the time those taxes hit, we're on the downside of the cycle. The industry can't afford hardly to pay the old level of taxes, let alone the new ones, and that magnifies the, the withdrawing of investment. We look, may think that's not so much in the U.S. We have a fairly stable. Uh, it's certainly been a problem elsewhere, but even in the U.S. Look at Alaska these days. Uh, they, they have changed their tax system every three years for the last 12 years, following the price cycle and always being out of step with what the market would allow in terms of fair taxation. But well, to, I'm going to counter that, though, slightly, uh, just slightly. Uh, a, a mentor to me uh, in the industry is now 78 years old, a man named Herb Detterding. I'm sure any of you know that name. I think he's one of the brightest men in the industry I've ever had. He was uh, with Mobile, then he took over Wintersol, uh, owned by BSF, a uh, very, very successful oil and gas company, primarily in Russia and elsewhere. He said, Joe, if you want to go to the international oil and gas business, you have to be prepared for the government and the country you're involved in to take more from you every single year. The first deal is to get you in, but they're going to take more every single year. If you aren't prepared for that and cannot work around that, keep making money as they increase the tax, stay out of the business. Yeah. So everyone I know who's in international business has, has had that philosophy, and those who haven't are out of business. Those who have survived knew how to make the things work so that even though the government was taking more every year from them, this is non-US primarily, uh, they made it work. Uh, and I think what's happened more recently is uh, governments have wisened up uh, that you can't keep doing that, or I'm not coming back, uh, basically. But I think most companies are used to it. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think there's been quite a cycle of activity in the North Sea that's been triggered by excessive taxation and a lot of rejiggering on the Norwegian and the UK side there. So as a general principle, yes, the companies know that they're always going to be out of sync and they've got to be prepared uh, and they've got to resist these efforts as well, and they do that strongly, but I think the governments have had quite a substantial impact on investment, uh, especially in the high cost areas. Right. We're back to the same metric, though. The only way you can survive, the thing that won't change is human behavior. So the, the, the kleptocracies are not going to change their behavior very much. They're still, they'll, they'll, they'll lie to you, right? You know this better than I do. It, it, so they'll say we've changed our behavior. We promise we won't tax you more in the future if you come here and spend a billion dollars now. And once your sunk cost is in, the steel is on the ground, the rigs are floating, uh, you, you, you know, that's, they got you. So here's what, what will happen. I'm more bullish on deep water uh, than most people on pricing, mostly because of companies like GE. So I'm going to toot GE's horns. What, What's happened in the offshore business is a remarkable technological activity. We've built, to Mike's point, these custom-built billion-dollar things. I mean, so everyone builds billion-dollar things in a custom-built way because it's a billion dollars. 
But at some point, a billion dollars is, doesn't feel as much like a billion dollars anymore. When you're a global economy of a hundred trillion dollars, a billion dollar asset becomes more commoditized. What GEs and the Siemens and the ABBs of the world are doing now, and what you saw in Exxon's latest announcement bragging about their breaking records on a supercomputer you know, with a reservoir model, I, I think it's utterly predictable that deep water costs go down a lot and we get standardized, uh, highly automated, you know, profoundly better offshore activities. And, and to your point, cleaner. That cycle takes a little bit. I mean, it's not going to happen in a year or two, but it's, it's, to use my Drucker line again, it's already happened. If you, if you, you know, read the annual reports where you find the public information, but if, you know, if, if I went and hung out at your shop, I've done this at, you know, Baker's shop and others, and you ask the engineers, what are you building for the next generation? You know what they're building. I mean, it's astonishing what efficiencies are coming. Deep water will get cheaper, it will get competitive, and I'll, I'll say again, countries that sort of control those assets, a lot of them have nothing else to invest in. So then when Devon decides they want to do it again, uh, because the, the potentate will lie to them, they'll at least know that they're doing it on a, on a lower cost basis, and they'll be able to get through 10 years before they get pillaged again. Oh, I'd like to talk a little of this yeah. technology do, side. Yeah. So, you know, Mark referred to Shale 2.0. Um, I, I, I would say I define chapter one of our industry as vertical wells and conventional reservoirs. Chapter two was horizontal wells and unconventional reservoirs. And chapter three in, in Mike's book is uh, smart everything. And I know the industry has pulled the technology lever to get to where we are today. That's why we're doing so much with 500 rigs. I would make a, a somewhat provocative statement that we really haven't even moved that lever this much. Agreed. There is so much more technology, especially with the digital side of things and analytics. We are literally in the first inning of this. So if we're in Windows 1.0 right now and we're going to Windows 13, um, it's it's going to be pretty amazing, and, and I know the industry generates a lot of data, but if you compare what we do as an industry with that from an analytics standpoint, an automation standpoint, an optimization standpoint, we're we're nothing compared to you know some of the new market caps that are out there, and that excites me about you know what we do. Um, we think there's so much running room here, it's, it's unlimited on the technology side, and that goes back to the supply Absolutely. side. Let me ask you a question on the offshore, Mike. Uh, what are you seeing? I mean, I'm hearing, and it goes back to the comment you made about BP and others, other majors that are operating offshore, deep water offshore, that they're really you know, pushing the limits on how you produce. So sub, uh, you know, advanced subsea technology would be a way to get there. Is that what's happening? Well, there's there's two sides. If you, you start on the capex side, okay, it's really expensive to drill offshore. So you may have seen a public announcement here a while back where we, as a company, entered into we we make blowout preventers. We entered into a new uh, arrangement. Instead of selling the blowout preventer to the drilling contractor, we actually take the ownership back and we guarantee performance of that. So we have a proven business model. It's the same with our aircraft engines. We, we completely shifted how we work that market now, and it's, and it's more about selling thrust than it is about selling an engine at high margin. And to do that, you have to take the risk out so you can make these kind of performance guarantees. And then that starts to come into sensing and analytics and other things. So on the CapEx side, that goes to driving the cost down, as Mark said, but then on the production side, um, you know, you, you just take, for example, the economics of an offshore discovery. It's, it's really, today, tough to make a 100 million barrel discovery work if you've got to put floating infrastructure in on it. So you, wait, before, before it changes, you, you've hit a really good point. It's the business model that's changed, too. That's your point with, with GE. And it's the business model that has happened because of, I don't have my cell phone right now, but because of that world. It's a win, win, win world. Rather than GE winning and you losing, well, I'm, uh, I'm losing your GE. Uh, we all win. That, mo that business model has changed the game, too, as much as the technology. The t technology has allowed the business model to evolve to more, I call it, efficient and productive systems. You can't, over can't overlook that as well. 
scale fields are going to do the same thing. I mean, the, the capacity for analytics to tap into this, this, this stunningly rich resource base, when you look at the efficacy of a typical rig, I mean, we all know if you look at the, the geophysical resource versus what's extracted, you're taking a fraction of, of, of it out, a tiny fraction, in fact, a fraction of a percent in most cases. But most of your gains are now in the future going to be in analytics and understanding. Right. And I, I'm 100% with you. I think you're going to see a lot of smaller companies take the GE model to the shale fields and GE themselves. If you start thinking about which piece do I disintermediate, if I can make the rig instead of a you know, a $10 million CapEx deal, it's a service deal, and it's $5 million in CapEx. We know that's coming. Uh, we already see some hints of it. We've, we've mapped out, in, in my little universe, a couple of hundred uh, startup companies that we were, we're defining as digital oil field companies for the shale fields, but they're really all software related. They're not making new drill bits. They're not making new motors. You guys can make the best motors on the planet. I mean, the, why would you try to invent a new electric motor? What you can do is... Very clever in the analytics to run that motor. Uh, you, you spoke earlier, you made a reference, you've been in the baker shop, so if you all don't know, if everything goes no, right, we, we will be the baker shop here in uh, <laughs> exactly. sometime I mid-year. Know. It's a good shop to buy, <laughs> yeah. by the way. But, but this, uh, <laughs> this, this thing about the new business model, um, so you take the win-win-win thesis of that in, in jet engines, so you know how did the win-win-win work? Actually, with this kind of performance-based model, we deliver more value to our shareholders. Okay, we get more margin because we produced a better product. Yeah. The airline now is sort of out of the engine business. They just want to haul people, so they deliver more to their shareholders. And the passengers actually, you know, are benefiting from cheaper transportation costs, but they're also benefiting from a safer platform. So if you aren't aware and you fly in an aircraft with a GE engine, which is probably likely what you're doing, that engine is in incredibly densely equipped with sensors and all of those sensors go back into the cloud and that information is analyzed regularly and it says, okay, this engine says don't take off again until you fix me or it says you need to fix me in a month or it says everything's okay, okay? And this happened from an aerothermal mechanical world to the adaptation of sensors and analytics. It's really changed the game. And there's another win you missed. The more efficient engine. Oh yeah, because it's all about which, which, which means yeah. lower cost and less pollutants, better for the environment. M m massive wins. And orders in the aircraft engine business are won and lost on one percent fuel efficiency. Let me, let me ask another question on the oil side of uh, resource limitations. Uh, in your book, you <laughs> quoted a number of people said the 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 age of oil is over. This was uh, going back to, you know, a few years past. Uh, uh, I remember when I started to think about changing my major to petroleum engineering in 1967 or 8, my dad told me there was no, and he was a petroleum engineer and in the oil business, he said there's no future in it. Uh, I go, well, okay, he's 92 now. He said, oh, yeah, you were right. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, everybody, people talk about what are the limitations of oil resources in the world? Uh, uh, well, like in, in, in horizontal, horizontal, the Bakken and, and, and the prolific uh, oil-producing uh, shales, I mean, the oil molecules are big. You've got to have the right kind of geology uh, to make this work. I mean, it doesn't, gas is different. Gas molecules are smaller. They're easier to flow in, in, in this kind of permeability rock. What are the limitations for oil resources from what you're hearing? Um, the, the, the short answer is politicians are the limits. Not the engineers, okay. not, not, not Mother Nature. Right. But I want to just lay down a marker because uh, we're all of a similar age, but I was, the, I, just for the record, I was the guy that never said that there was scarcity. I, I was, that's, our book was titled The Bottomless, the bottomless well. well. Bottomless yeah. Well for a reason. So when the peak oil theory was at its peak, I was the guy testifying before Congress and, and at cocktail parties where I was told I was a nut job because... That was, look, the, the physical, geophysical resource base is astonishing. Uh, we have a certain naivete about the scale of the Earth ever since we left the planet and looked back at it. It's a really big rock. so a lot of stuff in it. The reason we can't get to it is limited by just two things. The technology making it cost effective and governments, which means politicians, preventing you from operating in an effective way. And, and 
it's so long term, the answer, my view of the answer to the question is all practical purposes, that is, looking forward in time frames that are meaningful, let's say a century, there is no limit to the quantity of oil that the world can supply at prices people will pay, uh, technologically or from a resource perspective. Just none. In fact, the extreme environmentalists, as you know, those who hate oil, I'm not talking about all of us are environmentalists in the classic sense of the world, but the ones who hate oil, uh, have changed their tune, right? They talk now about keeping it in the ground. You know, McKib McKibben, who I've argued with for 25 years, is an honest environmentalist. He, he walks the walk. He lives in a tiny cabin in Vermont. God bless him. Uh, he doesn't drive big cars. He, you know, he does all, he, he drives his bike. But he has changed his thesis, and he has says, he says, for all practical purposes, his words, we have unlimited supply, but we have to keep it in the ground. We can't afford to use it. For the planet. That's his view. So they push peak demand, or we have to have peak demand, but no one who is really thinking about it thinks we have a supply limit. Let me jump in and say, I, I don't mean to be unkind to you. Others also said, I know. There's not peak oil. <laughs> like me, yeah. I'm sure you said the okay, same thing. It's going to go on uh, record as uh, well. Yeah. I mean, I got slammed. I got slammed. You weren't loud enough about it. You should have written a book. I, I, was, I, was I, chased, I was chased out of Houston, Texas uh, 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 by some folks uh, who, who bought, who bought uh, a Matt's View because yeah. uh, it meant high prices, okay? Uh, and Matt was a dear friend of mine, a uh, very dear friend. And I re regret his passing. Uh, but he, I said, Matt, you, you, you're misinterpreting the Hubbard curve. You misinterpret all those factors on it. You're, 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 you're constraining them. I, I agree entirely. And the whole world basically agrees. Can we get it out in a satisfactory way, number one? Uh, do we have the, the license to operate, which is the same, same concept? And we should have it, and we do have it. Uh, and then how do we make it cleaner? And we're going to make it cleaner. Categorically, you always, you've always been, well, always for me is my career, <laughs> made it cleaner. We've done it, we've done it already. Yeah. 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 You know, Bruce, I think if, if you look at a, a great depiction of, of the resource base is what's called the resource triangle or the resource pyramid. It's a concept promoted by Steve Holditch and Bill Fisher and others. And it's like a, an iceberg, really. And, and the top part of that was conventional oil. And, and it's a very small amount of the total resource base. And as you go down into that pyramid, the volume goes up exponentially because the quality of the resource is going down. That's right. And, and essentially, to, to Mark's point, if you go far enough down into that pyramid, in, in terms of human consumption of energy, the supply is essentially infinite. So if you take oil, for example, in the Bakken, recovery factors in these reservoirs might be 5 to 10 percent, okay? You take a conventional oil reservoir, uh, you know, it might be 30 to 50 percent. If you take a conventional gas reservoir in high permeability, as a producing engineer, you give me enough time and I'll give you 90 or 95 percent recovery, yeah. Yeah. okay? So just say that we were able to and drive recovery factors from 5% to, to 10 or 15%. All of a sudden, it's staggering, and, and that's where the technology lever gets pulled. So I, I, the, the supply is infinite. We, I'm not a leave-it-in-the-ground guy, obviously, but the, the fact is we, we won't ever use all the oil in the ground. You know, and that's, that's 40, fascinating. 40, you, think about, uh, you think about uh, other countries that haven't even tapped... The, the, the technology and, and, and their shales. Uh, there are shales everywhere. Well, not, not everywhere. There are some countries business. that aren't as blessed as others. But, you know, uh, when we, look, we looked at this five years ago in our first symposium, and we said, yeah, the lack of access to land, the policies, you know, all this kind of stuff, not in my backyard in Britain, for example, are, are going are gonna to slow down the pace of that. New York. Yeah, New York. Uh, well, but, but, but one strong comment, though. There is and there are a lot of other shale provinces, big ones. Some maybe even bigger than here, actually. Sure. But Argentina. The difference, the difference is we are a special country. We have property rights, individual property rights. That's, the revolution happened because we're innovative, a new technology, and property rights. There's a great incentive for people to lease their land to you guys because they benefit from that. No other country in the world has that except the United States. If you, take, if you take those three factors, and I would say the innovation is, in fact, property rights is an innovation if you think about human history. 
very innovative idea that America found. But that means that the lead America has with its shale fields is so astonishing that when people say, when will Russian shale catch up, or Chinese shale, or British shale, and the British are trying to game the system to basically emulate property rights by giving people royalty shares of some, in some, in some tax scheme. No, they're, they're giving it to the communities. To, that's not the same as me getting my back pocket. <laughs> exactly. It, what that fundamentally means is that we, we've built roughly in net present value terms in 10 years. The private markets that are in Oklahoma, Texas, and Bakken have spent a trillion dollars of real money in inf new infrastructure that didn't exist before. In a, in a market where we have free access and private, private rights to sell our minerals and in a technologically innovative province. Th this is an astonishing combination that nobody, I mean literally, no one in the world can replicate for a very long time. This has huge geopolitical implications, not just economic. This, this is staggering but, for the Saudis. But Given the peak oil scenario, the prices are going to fly up again. You can be sure that even in those countries, they will find a way to exploit those resources. Well, I agree. Yeah. They'll, but they'll to your point them. on a, the competitive advantage in North America, you know, there's an upfront cost to start. And so with an established pipeline network, with all these things. Service sector. Service companies. We, that, that's a sunk cost for us, so we don't have to factor that in. It's that's the just velocity. It's the marginal time. development costs now. Also the velocity. Yeah, you know. and, and then I'd add a couple other things to your points of why it started here. And, you know, in terms of this capital and capital's a coward, just having regulatory certainty, and in, in some would say we don't have it in North America, but compare it to the rest of the world, they have it. where you're going to go invest capital and you have to be assured that your investment's going to be safe over time, uh, you know, just take Oklahoma, for example, with our Corporation Commission. I mean, they're good. They, they know what they're doing, okay? They know how to regulate the industry. That is That, that provides some comfort to those who are going to invest, okay? Um, so lots of these things add up. Can it happen around the world? The rock is, is everywhere around the world. By definition, if you have conventional reservoirs, you have to have unconventional reservoirs. It had to come from somewhere. Okay, but if you take the rest of it, pipeline infrastructure, oil field service infrastructure, regulatory certainty, markets that are actually willing to pay, uh, you know, all of those things. It'll be a while. No, re regarding, a while. regarding the question of scarcity and the abundance or the, uh, the adequacy of the resource base, I think we should remember that oil is really not a special case at all. Go back to the 1960s. How many people read the Club of Rome report, The Limits to Growth? This was a hypothesis that the world before the year 2000 was going to come to a crashing halt because there was not enough agricultural land, we couldn't feed our growing mm -hmm. population. Every aspect of the natural resource base was limited, it was hypothesized, and soon to be exceeded by demand. They left out prices. My old colleague again, what about the demand curve? If something is scarce, it's reflected in, at least in a market pricing system. Most of the world is on a market pricing system. What does the price do? It signals the scarcity, but it also provides the capital to address the scarcity through technical change, through ad advanced investments, through substitution to alternative ways of getting the usefulness uh, of drawing on the energy or the natural resources. The Club of Rome was a tremendous failure because they left out the important role of the institution of the market. The market serves all of the resources. It certainly serves, in the U.S. and most of the world, the energy resources. It helps regulate the, the degree of investment, which helps regulate the price. I think the Club of Rome, I disagree with you. I think the Club of Rome report was critical to our changing think thought pattern. It, 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 it motivated us to challenge them. Uh, I thought it was, I mean, it I think the report was wrong for all the, all the reasons you say, but it actually stimulated a whole body of thinking. It did. That, that proved them wrong. So I, think, I, provide, I don't think that's why they did the report, but it stimulated all that work. Thank them for doing that. You yeah, thank them for doing it, yeah. So they, they, the lesson, you know that the lesson has not been learned. I mean, the Malthusians are still alive and well. Oh, yeah. They're still saying the same thing in more sophisticated terms than the Club of Rome. Their new thesis, in effect, is that I think what the Club of Rome forecasters got wrong, I think they, they somewhat understood the price response of the markets. What they really believed 
was that technology had stopped developing sufficiently to respond to the price signals. That if you really believe that you can't make technology that much better, if you're, let's, I, I would call it myopic, but it, they, they, they thought they were realistic. We have the same behavior today. In fact, you know, Gordon at Northwestern, where I, you know, he is a real economist too, as you know. He's, he's a very, very bright guy very good writer. He's essentially saying in his new it's you know, opus 10. that innovation is finished. Oh, it's all you know, better apps for smartphones, but not, nothing as big as plumbing, steam engine, electricity has, has happened since then. It's not going to happen again. That, this, is, this is exactly the same kind of thinking the Club of Rome had. And if you believe that, the price going up when, on, on scarcity doesn't solve the problem. It just causes wars because you have no solutions. That, that's a strong point because right now I'm involved with a lot of little, little technologies, which, which I, with people I call crazy technology entrepreneurs. That's a term of highest respect from Joe Stanislaw, law, <laughs> if you respect me at all. Uh, because there are two debates in the world right now. You have the Bill Gates. I mean, you know, I can never achieve what he's done. We need super big projects to solve this problem. Billions and millions and billions. Then you have some other billionaires saying, no, 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 no. It's all the crazy technology entrepreneurs. The little guys are going to solve this problem. They're, they're like the termites in that wall. Well, not in that wall. It's, met, it's, 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 a, it's a stone. But a wood wall. You don't see termites until the, the wall falls down. That's what these little guys are doing. The water company I'm involved with, 70% less water needed. That's efficiency. I'm involved with an insulation company, making an insulation of R50. No one's ever done it before. We've done it. Uh, that reduces you know, use of energy tremendously. No one's seeing that. Those are happening every place. Uh, and that's what the people are missing. The big guys say, we need this big push. I'm going to put my million dollars here, well, not my, my billion dollars here to do this. That's, that may have a great result in 50 years. But all these other ones, it's going to happen day in and day out, uh, bringing that stuff along. Let's talk about natural gas real quick. Uh, uh, we've got about 30 minutes left. I want to spend some time on natural gas. Uh, many experts, and in, including this Energy Institute have espoused the theory that natural gas has to be our bridge to the future. It's, it's abundant, it's economical, it's low carbon impact as we've got in terms of the massive base fuel. How do you, uh, how do you all feel about that, that premise? Uh, if you look at it from the standpoint of production capacity and reserves, I mean, gas globally is just enormous potential. Uh, how do you see the future for natural gas? I, I would start in, and just as a company, you could go Google it. We have a paper, a white paper, called The Age of Gas. Um, we clearly see it as an enormous part of the energy future. We see it as the path to bring 2 billion people around the world out of poverty to the middle class. Um, but I also see it as a component of, of what I'll call the clean energy economy. And, and there's different camps on what that means. There's clearly a sector in the United States, clean, the definition of them to clean energy is anything that doesn't have fossil fuel in it. And I'll make a contrarian case, it's not contrarian in this room, but fossil fuels are absolutely part of the clean energy economy. Natural gas is hugely part of it. As you said, we are going to get cleaner, we've gotten cleaner. We're going to continue to press that. We're going to have less surface impact. Uh, we're going to do more with less. If you just take carbon emission reductions, the United States has lowered its carbon emissions by more than all the rest of the world combined, uh, mostly due to combined cycle uh, power generation. Uh, this is an extraordinarily efficient way to use energy. And so we are going to drive uh, a, a clean energy economy and in a world of abundance. Consumers now have choices. The developed world, I think, has a different set of choices than the developing world. But they're saying, you know, clean is now part of one of the attributes that I consider when I make a purchase decision. Um, but natural gas is a huge part of this, um, and, 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 and its future is literally unlimited. I started out, you know, trying to convince folks uh, at my alma mater 20 years ago that this is part of the future, and, and finally got them to convince it, it was a, a bridge to the future. And, and, and I said, look, guys, it, it's not just a bridge. It's a, it's a destination, too. It's absolutely a destination. There is so much natural gas out there. It's, it's staggering. Yeah, and if someone wants to deny that it's a bridge or a destination, they have to explain what the bridge is. Well, it's not 
solar and it's not wind because those are two location specific and they're intermittent and they're expensive and it'll come down and they'll be part of the mix, but, but they don't provide the destination by themselves. Uh, some people could say un until yesterday that nuclear might be the bridge, but Westinghouse's uh, mm -hmm. bankruptcy and I think has cast a pall over the, the future development of nuclear, even more so than some people already had felt was in store. So w what would it be if it's not gas? The, 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 the economy, society, you are not going to stop consuming energy. There is a demand for energy. There's a willingness to pay for energy. There's a willingness to pay to clean up after the use of energy and the production of energy. It's what we want, and that's what we'll get. Power generation, the source for electric cars, uh, power generation is going to be dominated by, by gas. It, it hasn't been. Coal's been the biggest, biggest component of that for a long time, but that's transitioning, and it's transitioning pretty fast. And the resource potential, I remember looking back just a few years ago, there was a... Uh, group of really smart geoscientists that came together and looking at the United States and North America, U.S. and Canada, and said there's there's at least a hundred years supply of gas uh, at, at at this time. Okay, it's really kind of looking at looking at it conventional resource-wise. Uh, I mean, who knows what the number is today? I mean, anybody, is anybody trying to estimate what when you when you consider well, sales? Well, in 1997, some Japanese researchers said. The global potential was 35,000 TCF. Steve Holditch, just a few years ago, with a graduate PhD student, did a, a much more rigorous analysis. And they said it's not 35,000, it's 125,000 TCF. So as you go down into the resource triangle, the number's going to get larger, not smaller. I recognize that, that a lot of companies have to break the word bridge in the modern uh, lexicon. But I'll, I'll just take the posture that the version of what you, you, you were saying, it's just, there is not a bridge. There is no bridge. There is no new physics and energy. The future is gas. There will be more coal consumed in the world. The demand for coal is not going down globally. It's going down domestically. Japan is building coal plants, as you know right now, because they had to uh, beg off nukes and they can't in fact, when they shut down all the nuclear reactors, I wrote a piece in Forbes and predicted they'd increase their oil burn by a million barrels per day, because all you had to do was look at the dual fuel capacity that was underutilized in the Japanese grid, and you knew what they'd have to do in the short term, burn oil like the Saudis. But the idea of a bridge requires you to have a vision, to your point, of what it is you're going to. And, you know, Gates has actually said it in a very articulate way recently, invoking the world's richest man again. How can you disagree with the world's richest man? I mean... I God just be, did. <laughs> I'd be right. But he, he, uh, he has said very clearly in a series of interviews over the last year that there, there are no technological solutions that can replace hydrocarbons. He erroneously used the word fossil fuels, but I, I prefer the word hydrocarbons, to replace hydrocarbons at the scale and price the world needs. And his words then, for those of you who didn't read this interview, easy to find. Just Google up Gates and the Atlantic interview, or Gates and the MIT technology interview. He said we need an energy miracle, and then he defined what he meant by miracle. He said we need new physics, new fundamental science and energy. This is not, you don't get this by, by subsidizing wind farms. That's not fundamental new science. You know, those, those technologies are on the technological asymptote. They're getting better at the same rate that GE's that turbines do, which is good, a few percent a year. Uh, you need things that are getting better at rates of 20 to 50 percent a year, and the only thing doing that turns out are shale rigs. Kind of, kind of interesting when you think about where the rate of change is yeah. in productivity on the energy front. Let's talk about the impact of LNG. Uh, in the past, I mean, gas was kind of locked up continentally due to pipeline systems, pipeline grids. Now with LNG, and uh, I mean, it wasn't that long ago we were, we were, and I know this because my old company was looking at building one of the first receiving terminals to degas, degas, and move gas in the United States from Algeria. Uh, now that's totally flipped, you know. Uh, how does how do you see the, the potential for LNG and, and the connectivity to the rest of the world impacting us uh, in terms of how we how we develop policy in this country to utilize our, our resources um, and and the potential to keep gas prices globally in a band of affordability that makes sense for a growing economy around the world? How do you see that? Well, the thesis in our age of gas is 
that nodes make networks more robust and every new node you put on just like the internet every new computer you know adds to the robustness of it and this global economy for gas is clearly LNG is going to be a huge part of that um, right now I think the capital markets are going to be the primary determinant of how many of these facilities get built they're not cheap they're really big the United States in the early 2000s had pushed the panic button kind of in the scarcity mentality and we built out this enormous import capacity of which we've used none and now you can't just run one of these things backwards it's you got to build a new facility and that's what we're doing now but nodes going into these networks are going to be important um, little things in LNG like the expansion of the Panama Canal uh, has been a big thing. You know, now U.S. gas can go run uh, gas-fired power plants in Chile because they can get the tankers through there now. Um, so it's going to be a big part, and the long-term future is really good for that. There's some short-term headwinds in that market right now, uh, especially around, you know, what projects have final investment decision. Um, but the long-term future of that is, to me, is... Yeah, I think the, the idea of nodes in a network is very useful here. Uh, we, we think, and we know that that increases efficiency, but there's a limitation in the, the LNG market in most of the world, which we don't have in the U.S., and that is the contractual structure, which is evolving somewhat slowly, but uh, evolving from a system where there is a lot of rigidity, a lot of long-term fixed-price contracts linked to oil, with no relation to the fundamental demand or value or price of the gas, which is limiting the ability of the system and the nodes really to distribute in an efficient manner the, the natural gas through the LNG channels. But that's changing, but it hasn't changed at the speed that maybe some people forecast five years ago. It's going to continue to change, but uh, re really the, 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 the viability of that market uh, is dependent partly on these institutional arrangements, apart from the, the the resource supply and the demand for the gas and the cost of of uh, you know building out the capacity, we have a futures market now for the first time, right? In gas, in global gas, which which to your point is the first signal of a real change, and the first shipment of LNG I think in in history changed its destination. This was what, last month changed its destination while it was in transit because the this is unprecedented in the LNG markets because, they're, as you say, they're, they're long-term fixed contracts between two big ca capital providers. Yeah, it's prohibited but, to that's, change that's, destination. This is a big signal. I think the signal that we saw was, was already behind us. It's what, before the United States, before the Sabine Pass sent the single M out, before, before we actually started permitting LNG ports, the fact that the United States was on track to do that from shale gas collapsed. We know it collapsed global gas prices because other producers started renegotiating, including Russia, because they knew if you want to if you want to depress the capital markets, keep the cowards afraid of building the LNG receiving terminals from the U.S. for Europe, you reduce your price now. Gazprom did that, right? So that's, that's a remarkable shift. Well, it, it comes down to a word you used, didn't want to use a while ago. You didn't actually say it. I'm putting it in your mouth. Stranded assets. No one wants a stranded asset. <laughs> uh, therefore, you can do everything you can to avoid being a stranded asset. Russia is your comment, uh, is, your, is your fact and proof. Uh, it changes markets. Uh, for years, we talked about natural gas as being stranded assets all over the world. It no longer is. Yeah. No longer amazing. is. And the ultimate is that vessel that Shell built is about two miles long. Uh, it's, a, it's a city on water that can go to remote areas and produce it, you know, liquefy it and ship it off. Uh, they can do what I call the, the milk run uh, philosophy of LNG. The whole game's changed. And it's changed because of resources again. It's changed because of you in this room. And it's changed because of business models. So, you know, to your point about contractual terms and, and yours, um, forever in the United States we sold gas on long-term pricing contracts. Now everything's sold pretty much on the spot market, okay? And Globally, gas has been sold as a coupled price to oil, and it's been sold under these long-term pricing contracts so that you can 
make the, the investment decision and the, the, again, the North American model is going to change the world, and there's no doubt that the global Bruce, I'm going to stop you, Bruce. Yeah. Tell us about China in your paper you just wrote about China and LNG in the United States. I think it's a very powerful political comment. It's just a, I, I think the ability to move gas anywhere is, is a significant uh, game changer for us in, in, a, in a geopolitical sense. If you look at China, that's trying massively to, to shift from coal to other resources to power their, their economic growth. Uh, natural gas has got to be a huge part of it. Their pipeline to Russia is behind schedule, over budget, and it won't, be, it won't fix the problem even if it gets done. Uh, to me, LNG is something that we could intentionally target as something that we could encourage U.S. companies to do. Uh, we, we would be a reliable supplier because the, st the source is steady. It's probably the cheapest in terms of the, land, the cost and then the landed cost of any supply they've got, so it's competitive. And for, from a geo geopolitical point of view, it could be establish a, a balance of payments directionally that's positive for us and kind of defuse some of the, the, the natural uh, tendencies we're going to have just through sort of fighting for territory in the Pacific. So I think the geopolitical consequences, and that's just one example for the U.S., are, are off the charts good. So this is, I mean, this is a tool that we need to be thinking about, talking about. It's not just for the benefit of the U.S. oil and gas business and the producers and the, and the, and the midstream, the pipeline suppliers, the people that build these plants, but it's for, from a strat strategic point of view, this is a huge game changer for us as a country. Not just the security we have of our own supply, but the ability to supply to others uh, in a way that, that changes the game uh, in terms of geopolitical connections. So it's just, just something to think about. I want to. We got a little bit of time. I want to open it up for questions. But um, you know, we've just gone through a big downturn, and we're not out of it yet. But we've seen the bottom. Okay, I hope. Knock on wood. Uh, more bottoms to come. You know, we always say, okay, I'm going to learn from that one. The old bumper sticker back in the mid '80s, late '80s was, "Please God, give me another boom, and I won't screw it up this time." And and, and, you know, those bumper stickers fell off, and we, and we, we kind of tend to forget. And, you know, so here we are. You know, Will Rogers, you quoted him a while ago. He's one of our most famous Oklahomans. He said, you know, good judgment comes from experience, and a lot of that comes from bad judgment. <laughs> so uh, there's been a lot of bad judgment exercised uh, in, in, in the process of setting us up for this last boom. So where are we today? What have we learned? And I, I want you guys... If you were sort of the king of energy in the United States, thinking about the, the long-term potential of this country uh, to be a viable, thriving economy for your children, your grandchildren, you're the king of energy, and, and you're going to advise what, what these guys ought to be thinking about in terms of transforming their companies, building a, a, net, a framework of industry behind this to make it happen. What would you advise? You're the king of energy. I would, I would start, and so we developed an energy plan for the governor here in Oklahoma, and the first thing that I always say is energy is a system. It's not discrete fuel silos. And so building a system that allows everything to play fairly, okay, is really important. So that's a regulatory environment. That's uh, Markets are funny things. They, they work if you let them, okay? Having infrastructure, nodes and networks to move things around uh, works. Um, wind and solar, you know, they may not reach the scale of oil and gas, but there's no doubt uh, solar generated electricity is going to be very price competitive in the market. Um, I think looking at it as a system and enabling the markets to work, the markets are, are going to work and people are going to make the choices. That's the key, let markets work. I think one concrete uh, step in that direction, and this is controversial, but I, I think many economists, I won't say that Joe is on board because we haven't discussed it. I'm not an economist, though, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> well, then, yeah, then you're, you're free to go Reform, either way. Reformed economists, right? <laughs> I think really it's time to consider a carbon tax to the extent that we're concerned about climate change. We've got lots of initiatives. Every country has different initiatives. We have many different initiatives. Most of them are a government picking favorites, promoting this, promoting that, based on short-term engineering assessments, faulty projections of demand, demographics. 
put a simple carbon tax that can't be manipulated. It's not very political in terms of who, you know, who's getting the entitlements uh, and to emissions credits or whatever. And then let them all play. Let you guys play against solar and wind and nuclear and you know whoever wants to compete and eliminate the subsidies, eliminate the, the non-market forces that have really strongly shaped where we are right now. It's, it's one step, it's a concrete step, but it's in complete sympathy with what you're saying about we really need to allow the market to solve this problem, just as it did back in the 70s when future demand projections were off the charts. The market solved that problem. Yeah, I mean, if you're, the, if, you're the king, if you're the king of energy, you're the king of Saudi Arabia, and you only have one product to sell to the world. But the, I agree with, with, with Mike. I, I wanna, I'll say one comment about carbon tax that ties to Bill Gates and, and why I, I would oppose a carbon tax unequivocally because, because of what governments do with new taxes. Uh, Setting aside why one would be motivated to do it, I don't trust uh, politicians given a new tax stream to eliminate legacy tax streams. Very little history to demonstrate that that's happened in the past, and that's why I don't see any evidence at other, that they would behave different in the future. But the king would. The king. We don't. We don't have. Yeah, a, 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 a benevolent dictator. The the the, the solution to these 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 the, the dynamic market to use the Will Rogers line, you have to have, if you have one or two companies, big companies that are capable of making bad judgments, the costs of that experience are high, right? So if you're, the, if you're making an energy policy, if you have an environment in which thousands of companies are making decisions, the market, the odds are much better, not perfect, but better at getting an outcome that's satisfactory. So that translates in political terms essentially into a liquid capital markets and, and liquid, liquid entrepreneurial environment. We have an environment that where the regulatory state is the single most damaging thing to entrepreneurship and new business development in the United States, both for large corporations, particularly small ones. The U.S. has not in its recorded history had more businesses disappearing than being formed. That We crossed over that ugly Rubicon three years ago and it's never happened. And it's happened not, not because the world needs stuff that people can invent and not because they're entrepreneurs, it's entirely because of the regulatory state. It's a shadow state that imposes staggering restrictions on a free market. As for a carbon tax, the problem with the carbon tax is really simple. We've already done the experiment on whether the tax, which would raise the cost of hydrocarbons, would change behavior. Right? Behavior meaning consuming less. At $100 a barrel of oil, we have a very good idea of how much oil the world's willing to consume at 100 bucks. It turns, it turns out a lot. It doesn't really, it, it changes uh, consumption a little bit. The elasticities of demand are there. But it doesn't change it that much uh, on a macro scale. So if a carbon tax has the equivalent cost of a couple bucks a barrel, it will have no impact on the consumption, in my opinion, of hydrocarbons. But it will generate a lot of money, and somebody is going to decide where that money is going to go. And so far, what politicians have demonstrated is the capacity to give money by picking winners and losers and subsidizing, subsidizing things that aren't sort of organically created in the marketplace. If you want Bill Gates solution, which is miracle, new science, you don't need that much money. You, you need to increase basic research, true basic research. You need to fund universities, basic sciences. That's where the magic catalysts come from, the magic PV cell, the magic uh, battery chemistry, none of which exists today. And they won't come from uh, subsidizing corporations to build wind farms. It just won't. You forgot, we forgot one king. What's that? Me. The king. Oh, you. Uh, or <laughs> dictator. Stanislaw. Or dictator. Whatever it happens to be. I don't want, I, I think Bill Gates is a marvelous guy. I mean, what he's done for the world is, is tremendous. I th I'm a great backer of, uh, you know, government-sponsored research. Big, big, big picture stuff. No potential, most of it, a lot of it, solved big problems for a long time. But from this, that research comes little things. For my crazy technology entrepreneurs, release my entrepreneurs. Release those technology guys. Amen. The small guys. And keep, let Bill Gates fund the big projects. But these guys are going to get you to the end and destination. Not a bridge, a destination of a different sort. I will just say one thing that I'm king. Uh, storage. Storage will become the market clearing uh, technology for energy in the future. If we create the right storage capacity, the right technology for it, 
and we want clean energy. And I believe oil is going to be clean. It is clean. It's going to be cleaner. Gas. I think coal is going to become clean, by the way. Uh, there's technology we're going to do to take, take the CO2 of the coal out when it's in the ground. Bill Gates bring it is up. doing that. Uh, and I, have, I know a small guy doing it, one of my crazy guys. Uh, give, me a, give me the new storage, and when I go, uh, when I go to buy my, my heat or my light or my mobility, I want it to be clean. That storage thing, it'll buy the coal or the oil or the wind or the solar and give it to me, and I know it's clean. And that will be the clearing mechanism, the storage capacity. That's my view of where the world's going to go. Bruce, I'd add on the clean part, regulation. So regulation can be construed as a bad word, um, but, it, but it's not. And reasonable regulation is a good thing. And, and I think the industry uh, is supportive of that. We're certainly supportive of that. But if you just look at emissions and criteria pollutants, and, and just take carbon off the table for a second. Just look at criteria pollutants, which are real health impacts. So there's NOx, SOx, particulate matter, whatever. Yeah. If fuels through regulation compete at the smokestack instead of at the burner tip, it's actually dramatically driven down carbon emissions when carbon emissions weren't the driver. And the state of the environment in this country is dramatically improved. And compare that to Asia, for example. So. There is a very real and important role for regulation. Uh, agreed, know. agreed. Reasonable regulation. Uh, we got time for just a couple of questions. Sorry, uh, we kind of run over, but a uh, couple of questions. There's a, one over here in the middle. You come to the microphone. There you go. Yeah, I'm Omkar Jarepetke with Pine Natural Resources. So one of the things that we've been talking about is clean energy, and we've talked a lot about it. My question was specifically to Mike. Um, as the Secretary of State for Energy, did we ever or did you ever think of an efficiency portfolio? Uh, we talk about energy, we only think of fossil fuels and hydrocarbons, and then we talk about wind and gas. But a lot of countries in this world think of energy independence and security. They may not have that many hydrocarbons and they're really looking at to having a good equilibrium efficiency portfolio. So in America, and with your experience, have you ever thought of that as a strategy? So actually we did, and it was a critical, one of the critical components of our energy plan. So there's a fellow named Amory Levins. Mark may elbow me in the side of the head here, but... Yeah. But, but anyway, he had a concept called megawatts, okay? And megawatts says if you generate electricity more efficiently, for example, you save those raw resources to generate more electricity. So in the energy plan for the governor, which Secretary Teague is now really driving that, um, we, we looked at energy efficiency across the board, state buildings, uh, you name it, because it's economic. It, it's a, it, the markets drove the decision. And in fact, uh, I forget what the year was, Oklahoma was the most improved state in the nation in energy efficiency. Energy efficiency leverages all forms of supply. There's no reason to just waste it, okay? Use it efficiently, and, the, and, and in the developed world, the energy intensity, you know, the unit of energy consumption per capita, it's going down, but the energy services continue to go up. And even the majors, the BP and Exxon in their annual energy reports, when they look at future projection, they actually count energy efficiency as a supply source. So it's absolutely a critical part. Is it possible, and I'm, I'm jumping, to, I'm going to conclude with this, but I'm going to ask the question. Volatility in prices has been a huge factor in the, in the past, and, and it, it you know, and people that are investing in big projects hate volatility. They like predictability. Is there a possibility now because of what we've seen and the impact of technology and how rapidly we can respond to challenges that will reduce that band of volatility and therefore promote a lower band of price, um, you know, uh, prices more, uh, more reliable in the future to make investment and in, in economic growth uh, more robust and more sustainable? Adequate supplies with robust, resilient networks, very much. Short answer, futures markets. Let, let, you know, 
Volatility in commodities has been around for all of economic recorded history. And it's solved fundamentally if you have a, a, a environment with the traders in the futures markets. That's a version of GE selling thrust hours. I'll, buy, I'll, I'll fund your risk. We've got a break now. Uh, Jay, how, how much time do we have? We're going to start. I, I could have listened to this group all day, couldn't you? I mean, this is just fantastic. Um, thank you all. Um, let's, we're going to start promptly at 10 uh, with Ken Hirsch. You won't want to miss that. So quick break, and uh, let's be ready, uh, back and ready to start at 10. <laughs>